Welcome, everybody. It's good to see all of you with us. want to say hi to everybody who's joining us in the live stream or later on in the week in the On Demand. We want to welcome everybody to part four, the conclusion of a series that we've entitled One Nation. And really everything in this series has, has centered around uh, a question. And that is how, how do we, as citizens of heaven, live as citizens in our country in the midst of everything that's going on? What does following Jesus look like practically? And what is God calling us to do? And it's, it's been challenging, I think, uh, on a lot of levels. And I'm, I'm thankful for all the feedback we've gotten through this series because it, it helps us to understand we're, we're navigating a, a difficult intersection in life. And this intersection between, between our faith and everything that's going on around us. You know, all the stuff with politics and a pandemic and economic instability and people losing their jobs and kids going back to school and mask mandates. And you, it's, like, it's like you got all this traffic and navigating the way around it isn't always the easiest thing to do. And so as we conclude this series, uh, we're really going gonna, gonna to introduce a controlling sort of metaphor or, or picture sort of an image to help drive everything that we're doing and, and hopefully make it, make it stick. And it, it's something, if you've been in Columbia for any amount of time, uh, you're very familiar with, and it's, it's the roundabout. It's kind of a controversial topic in and of itself. And I used to be on one side of the discussion, not a big fan of roundabouts, and now that they put them around everywhere, I've gotten used to them, and I kind of like them. They've reduced my commute on, on several days, so I, I appreciate that. I'm actually pro-roundabout now. But I want to show you probably what is considered one of the worst roundabouts in the world. And it's over in the UK. It's actually six roundabouts in one. And it, it has traffic inside of it going the opposite direction from each other. And you can get multiple ways around to go to one place from different angles. And when all the traffic's coming in at once, it's this conglomeration of just madness. And I think this is exactly what it's like in our lives to try to navigate faith in the midst of everything that's going on. And you got stuff coming from every different angle. And there's a roundabout there. And there's a little piece over here. And we got to navigate over here. How do you, how do you, how do, you do that? And, and I want to use this really as, as a metaphor as we move forward into the conclusion of this series that this is really what we're talking about. How do, you, how do you follow Jesus in the midst of this? How would you even know the right way to go? And what do you do when you get up to this intersection? How do you know which way to go? And so we've been kind of asking this question. How, how do we as Jesus followers navigate government, pandemics, finances, and relationships in the midst of everything? How do you follow Jesus? And so today, as we conclude this series, we're really going to build off of everything that we've done. And so if you've missed any messages in this series, let me, let me catch you up in 60 seconds or less. We started the whole series in Romans chapter 5, unpacking the reality that before we can talk about how to live in this country, we've got to know what it means to be a citizen of heaven. And so we really looked at, you know, this is a, this is a gospel kind of lifestyle. That everything that we do flows from the reality that because of Jesus, we have peace with God. That's, that's like our real hope. And our hope doesn't come from vaccines or economic stability or the White House or anything. It comes from Jesus himself. And with that lens, we can navigate the things of life much differently than maybe the people that, that you're surrounded with even right now. And so with that as the foundation for everything, we, we, we went into the scriptures and said, okay, when it comes to the word of God and how he instructs us to live life, what's the first step as living as a citizen in this country? And we examined these really tough passages and just one command that surfaced over and over and over again, it was submission. That's our primary role, to place ourselves underneath the civil authorities. And that was a tough message, and I got a lot of feedback on that message. And I'm so thankful, listen, I'm so thankful when you guys reach out and you share some of your struggles and the things that you're dealing with and how you're wrestling through uh, the series or a particular passage. It's so helpful for me to even know uh, where you're at. And then we built off that. So, okay, if that's the first step was submission, then the second step was actually like 
14 points of application. And for all my note takers, like this was the greatest Sunday you've ever been to church because we filled in a chart in church, right? And so we went back through those three passages in, in Romans and Titus and 1 Peter. The first thing we saw was submission, one command across those three texts. But then we saw the second step for everybody in those passages was a little bit different. And I think that was really encouraging for a lot of us to know, man, it has everything to do with our context. And then we kind of reduced those 14 points of application down to just two ideas, attitudes and actions. And we looked at it like, okay, so what's the next step? Like obedience, honor, respect, love, not quarreling, not fighting, not criticizing other people, letting our lives, this is how Peter said it, like letting our lives speak for us. That's the will of God for us. This is heavy stuff. And that's, that's what we're building off of today, a ton of application. And so we're going to go right here today, now that we've talked about all of this, and we're going to go right into the teachings of Jesus. And we're going to let him speak into this place. So really, you know, if we were to break down this series really simply, we're, we're looking at what the scriptures say about how we live in the midst of everything that's going on. And we're going to go to it as our source. And we're going to see what God's word has to say. When we step into that traffic circle, what's God calling us to do? And so we're concluding with these three moments in the life and ministry of Jesus where he speaks directly into our role underneath civil authorities. And today we're going to finish out the series really completing a single sentence. And this is just something bite-sized that we can take with us and reduce four messages into just one statement. We're going to live out the gospel through submission in our attitudes and actions while, and we're going to see Jesus fill in the blank here for us. So let's jump in. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 17. I'd love it if you'd come with me. The, these teachings of Jesus are absolutely brilliant. They're, they're so beautiful. And before we jump into these three separate teachings, I want to give you sort of the framework for what we're going to do, because we're actually going to be in 12 different passages today, and I don't want anybody to get lost as we're just like cruising through what the scriptures say. So really, all we're going to do for the, the next 25 minutes is talk about the three teachings of Jesus, and then we're going to answer the big question. The big question, when, it, when does God permit us to be civilly disobedient? When is it okay to rebel against authority? And then through both of these things, we're going to see a ton, a ton of application. So I would just encourage you all along the way today, be like, okay, what's the relevance for this in my life today? How does this apply to what we're going through right now? But really, we're just going to do these two things, but we're going to, we're going to go through a lot of content today. So stay with me. And before we jump into those, those three teachings of Jesus, I want to put two words up here. They're going to help us uh, as we navigate the complexity of this roundabout and these particular passages in general. And these two words, one is prescriptive and one is descriptive. Now these words sound really similar, but they're very, very different. Think about, you know, you go to the doctor and you describe to the physician what's going on and maybe what's hurting or what the problem is. And then that physician will then prescribe you to do something. So whenever we go into the scriptures, one of the tools that we can use in understanding what God is communicating is just to kind of have these two words in our mind. Is this, is this passage describing something or is it prescribing something? Is this a command that I'm listening to or am I watching how somebody's navigating something? So this is going to be really important, especially as we look at the teachings of Jesus, because we're going to see him. It's like we're, we're kind of going to be on the on the sidelines, and we're going to watch Jesus approach this roundabout with six roundabouts inside of it, and we're going to watch him navigate it, descriptive, and then we're also going to see him plant some signs in the road and be like, prescriptive, here's what I want you to do when you get into this particular intersection of life, and we're also going to see a bunch of other passages that are going to fit into this category right here. Now, typically what happens when we go into the scriptures and we see commands, we think they have the most relevance for our life. And that's partially true. But it is an interpretive fallacy to think that you and I can't watch Jesus do something and learn a lot. 
Now, it's not a straight-up command. He's not telling us, here's what I want you to do. He's actually showing us what to do. And this is how he teaches his disciples, both prescriptively and descriptively. Here's what I want you to do. Now, follow me, and I'm going to show you what to do. And so this is going to be really important for us as we dive into Matthew chapter 17. And I want us to just kind of be thinking, is this prescriptive or descriptive? How am I learning from this? Is it a command or am I watching how Jesus navigates this traffic circle? So Matthew chapter 17, this is kind of the the last third of his earthly ministry when we get to Matthew chapter 17. Uh, Really, really, uh, Jesus has become very, very popular. And there are these tax collectors that come up to one of his disciples by the name of Peter, also referred to as Simon. He has two names, Simon, Peter, Peter, Simon, same guy. And the tax collectors come up to Peter looking for what's known as the two drachma tax. Now, really quickly, this is a temple tax. So in Jerusalem was the temple. And in order for the temple to continue its work, to be maintained, to keep up its furnishings, to to pay the priests who functioned in the temple. There was a tax that was collected once a year from every male 20 years and older. So this is just normal everyday life living a thousand years ago in the land of Israel. This is very, very common. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch Jesus navigate life as it intersects with taxes and policies and religious obligations, and we're going to watch him navigate this, this complex issue. And they come to Peter, and what's really fascinating is they ask a question from a negative vantage point, almost assuming that Jesus is not going to pay the tax. Does your, does your teacher not pay the tax? Now, this is, this is really, the scholars have, have struggled with this particular question because of its inference. And we're going to skip over all that because it's all conjecture. It's all speculation. Like, why did they ask him in the negative? Because the assumption is there was something that made Jesus not have to pay this tax. He was somehow exempt from paying this tax. The scripture doesn't tell us what that is, so we're not going to spend any time on it. But we are going to look at what Peter says. He answers for Jesus. Hey, tax collectors come up. Uh, You guys aren't going to pay that tax, are you? Because we're collecting taxes. And instead of saying, no, we're totally exempt, Peter's like, oh, no, we're, we're totally going to pay it. He speaks for Jesus. Now, this is the reason why I don't point that out. Is th- this gives us a, like an insight and a window into what it was like to be with Jesus. That he could answer very, very quickly what his master was going to do because Peter has seen Jesus navigate these situations before. Inevitably, he's already seen this happen twice. So Peter knows how to answer the question. And that's going to be really important for us. And this is just like my little personal side note. Like, I love passages like this. They're very short. But they give us a window into what life with Jesus was like. And when it came to paying taxes, there was no question what Jesus was going to do. So Peter says yes, and then goes into a house to talk to Jesus. But before Peter can even say anything... Jesus, in classic Jesus teaching mode, this is masterful teaching, he says, uh, hey Simon, let me, let me get your opinion on something. From who do, do the kings of the earth take their toll or tax? Is it, is it from their kids, from their sons, or from other people? So we're watching Jesus step into a very crowded intersection. And instead of telling Peter what to do, He's challenging him to think critically about it. I want you to think about this, Pete. Who needs to pay the tax? Now think about this from the perspective of Jesus. Who is God's son? Who is the incarnate divine creator of all things? And he's like using this as a moment to bring Peter to a deeper understanding of what's really going on here. And subsequently, Peter's role in the years to come. And from this, Peter, Peter knows the answer. Well, the, he doesn't, the king doesn't tax his own son. And Jesus said, so the sons are, are free. They're exempt. 
Now here's where we could kind of include some of that language from the scholars about why would Jesus be exempt from the mentality of the tax collectors? Maybe because he's a rabbi, maybe because the, Jesus and his disciples were being supported by other people. Legitimately, they could have been excluded from the tax. The tax collectors might have been thinking of that. That's all conjecture. But in this moment, Jesus brings out the real truth. Pete, you know, we are exempt from this. And he makes Peter answer it through the question. It's genius teaching. And we're going to see Jesus speak really powerfully in the midst of this really complicated intersection. But we're going to hear a lot of things that he doesn't say. Because Jesus doesn't say at this moment, you know, uh, Peter, I wish you, wouldn't have, I wish you wouldn't have said yes. Because uh, the truth is, that whole system, the temple, that all, point is, that all points to me. It doesn't make any sense for me to pay for a system that ultimately points to me. There's incongruency there. And he doesn't say to Peter, hey, I, I really wish you wouldn't have said yes because if we pay that tax, we're actually going to be contributing to the paycheck of these priests who not too long from now are going to be screaming to crucify me. And that's not, that's not good, Pete. And Jesus in this moment doesn't say, you know what, I wish you wouldn't have said yes because... Some of that money is going to go into the temple treasury, and it's that treasury that the money for my betrayal is going to get paid out to Judas. Yeah, Judas, the one who's been following me around for three years. Jesus doesn't say any of that. He has every right to say it. And so when we hear what he does say, it's, it's, it's quite shocking. However, not, not to give offense to them. Go to the sea, cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you're going to find a shekel. A shekel was worth four drachma, which would have been the tax for both Peter and Jesus, and give it to them for me and for yourself. Jesus was more concerned about causing those tax collectors to stumble than he was concerned about exerting his rights. Now we're watching Jesus step into the traffic circle, right? And we're kind of standing on the sidelines going, oh, that is, that is legitimately difficult. Because you and I have watched many, many people navigate this traffic circle with a bullhorn screaming about their rights. And we're seeing a different way. And I know, I know for a lot of us in this country, right now in the midst of everything that's going on, th this teaching seems to me more radical than ever before. And I want to just challenge us to, to hold it all like, okay, um, I see a lot of people doing it this way. I see a lot of people going around this roundabout again and again and again and again. But when I look at this from the vantage point of Jesus, he goes a different direction. And I want to just, on the, on the front end of this, just really challenge you, like, when, when you get into this intersection, who are you following? What signs are you paying attention to? Because it can make all the difference in the world. Now, pop quiz. Is this passage descriptive or prescriptive? Is Jesus issuing a command for all of Christians, for all of time, to pay a temple tax? Or are we listening to a description? Are we, are we watching Jesus navigate the traffic circle and, and plant a sign in concrete for everybody to follow? Or are we just watching how he navigates us? Don't answer. The first service, they fell for this. And this is between you and me. They didn't do too good. They were like, oh, it's prescriptive. And I was like, well, no, it's descriptive. But that's okay. We'll do this together, right? We're watching how he does it. And think about what he did with Peter. He wanted Peter to watch how he did it. He wanted to really challenge him. And how, how do you think through this, Peter? I don't want to just give you the answer. I want to, like, let's, let's navigate this together because it's, it's sometimes complicated. So the first of three teachings of Jesus. Now let's go to the second one. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 22. This is probably one of the most famous teachings of Jesus when it comes to this particular intersection of faith and government and authority. 
And Jesus speaks into this intersection three different times. And by the time we're in Matthew 22, we're probably at the height of Jesus' fame and popularity. And uh, he had a huge target on his back uh, because he was really challenging those who held positions of power and authority. And he was challenging them with a message of hope and love and forgiveness. And they hated him for it. So much so, like, people that were enemies, like the Herodians and the Pharisees, or like people who supported the king, they were called Herodians, and like the religious leaders, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, maybe you've heard some of these names before, like the, the, the religious leaders are now joining forces with their enemy because they now have a common enemy, which is Jesus. And they're always trying to trap him. You know, kind of imagine they, 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 they want to bring Jesus into this really complicated intersection, but before he gets there, they want to lay some traps. So they, they throw some oil out on the road. They throw some tire spikes out on the road. They put a big trap door. And they're like, hey, Jesus, you're so awesome, Jesus. You always say cool things. Uh, what about this one, though? Why don't you tell us whether it's right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, this gives us a, a, a great picture of one of the hot button issues in the time of Jesus. And there was in a, a wildly oppressive taxation system that you know, people in the Jewish nation were losing their homes and their family farms and their families were, were in utter poverty, had trouble eating because these corrupt tax collectors were taking more than they needed to just to put a pool in their backyard. And, and the religious leaders had a hard time with some of these taxes because some of that money was going to further the advancement of the Roman Empire, which was, according to the good Jewish leaders, it was, it was a pagan empire. It was an anti-God empire. That Some of those taxes were going to build shrines to false gods. Like that, 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 that traffic circle was really, really difficult in the time of Jesus. And they're like, all right, come on, Jesus. And he says, you guys, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? Show me, show me a coin that's used to pay the, to pay the taxes to Caesar. And they hand him a, a Roman coin. And he just says, whose picture and title are stamped on it? And they're like, Caesar's. Well, give it to Caesar. And give to God what belongs to God. And this is one of those passages that is so often used in political climates like the one we're in now, by, by really well-meaning Christians who are navigating a very difficult intersection and, and they're following the examples from other people who have done the intersection before and they're looking at signs that tell them where to go and, and in so doing, they, they veer off the path of Jesus. And, and a lot of people will focus on this phrase right here, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but give to God what's God. We kind of leave this part out. We, we, stop, we stop really thinking critically like, what is God calling me to do? What does God want from my life? How do I look at this through, through the lens of the gospel? How do, how do I let like, the, the redemption and forgiveness that I have been given, how does that shape how, what comes out of my mouth and how I live? Right? We, we want to sidestep all of that and stand on our little platforms and scream to other people that what we think is right and our bias is right and we want, we want God on our side and we weaponize our faith to pull other people down and then we wonder why we keep going around in circles when we get to this intersection and why we keep veering off the road and ended up in places we never thought possible. With Jesus, it's super clear. It's like, yeah, taxes, pay your taxes. <laughs> What's so complicated? And the issue for the religious leaders was they were making it all about the systems and where can we rebel and where do we draw the line and they had neglected everything that God had actually called them to do. And his reply amazed them. And then they went away. The trap was sprung. They actually entrapped themselves. And what's fascinating is that all uh, three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record this, this incident and they all say something to the effect of everybody was stunned at the answer that Jesus gave because they watched him navigate that 
that roundabout so beautifully. It was like, oh. And I think it should have the same impact on us. When we ask the question, what's our role in, in this particular climate and everything that's going on, what are we supposed to do? Let's, let's watch Jesus do it because he's brilliant at it. All right, pop quiz. Is that passage prescriptive or descriptive? This one's a little bit easier because the command that he gives is very obvious. This is a prescriptive passage. Oftentimes, we'll look at something that's prescriptive and think, oh, that's where all the application is. Well, there's a lot of application in there. There's a lot we can learn from the things that Jesus said, and there's a lot that we can learn from watching what Jesus did. He didn't use that as an opportunity to rail against them. He didn't go into some long soliloquy about his rights and his role. He was like, no, this is very simple. Watch. And I'm going to put a big sign right in the middle of this roundabout so that everybody knows who comes after this moment, they'll know exactly what to do. And my challenge to us today is, have you seen that sign? And here's what I know to be true. Sometimes, it, listen, roundabouts are a thing in Columbia. And if you've ever gone up to one that was newly installed, they take all the barricades away, and the signs are up, and you get, you get up to it, and you slow down, you're like, ah, and you just go a little bit slower that first time because you've never done it before. I think that's exactly what we need to be doing right now. Because in those moments, for whatever reason, we, we, we don't seem to have the ability to pay attention to the signs. Actually, I talked to a guy after last service. He was like, I've, I've driven that traffic circle in Swindon. That's the name of the town. He's like, it was awful. <laughs> and I was like, you did what? That's amazing. You know how di- you know, nerve-wracking that would be? I heard another story from somebody else. Like, they, uh, they got to Ireland, and they got into a rental car, and they pulled out of the rental car place, and they had to get onto the highway, and they're driving on the wrong side of the road, and to get onto the highway, they had to go through a roundabout. And it was like, for some reason, when I got up there, he talked about how he couldn't, like for whatever reason, there were all these signs telling him what to do, but because he was so nervous, he couldn't see them. And he's just like, he was like, I went around the roundabout a few times just trying to get onto the highway, and I'm like, that's like our life. We get up to these intersections, and we just were like, I don't know what to do. And I can just, this is where I hear the invitation of the scriptures going, I want want you to know what to do. I want you to be able to go into that intersection knowing exactly where to go. Follow, Follow Jesus through that. Watch how he does it. Watch the signs that he put in the road. And we're gonna we're gonna jump into the third the third time Jesus speaks into this place. And this is the most difficult one. Uh, for me personally, because it comes at the end of what I think is the most difficult uh, intersection of his, of his earthly life, and it was like the, the last 24 hours. And so he, he's in the garden that very last night, and he's praying, and his disciples keep falling asleep, and he, he knows what's coming, and he's like, he's in this like place of agony. And then one of his own, his own followers comes out with this this crowd of hundreds of people with, with clubs and sticks in the middle of the night to this, this really quiet garden. And when Jesus hears him come, and this is so fascinating, we have so much to learn. When he walks into this intersection, he actually confronts the issue. He's like, who are you looking for? I mean, if, if, if there was a mob coming to your house, I don't think our first instinct is to go greet them at the door. We're going to be like, we need to run and hide. And he just stands right up. He's like, who are you looking for? And they're like, we're looking for Jesus. And he's like, that's me. And you're looking for me, so let my guys go. And Judas comes up. Judas didn't need to come up. He had already identified himself. Judas comes up and kisses him as a way to signify who it was we needed to capture. And Jesus is like, you're going to betray me with a kiss? You know how difficult? I mean, that's like like soul-crushing moments. And Jesus surrenders himself. And then he gets put on trial. Six phases, six different trials, uh, three religious and six civil. 
And what he does in these trials is so magnificent. I mean, it is life-changing to watch him navigate that complexity. And we don't have time to jump into all six of those passages, but if you've downloaded our app, you can click on um, sermon notes, and I've, I've actually listed all six of those trials there. And I, I just want you to, at some point today or through this week to go and, and, and look at what Jesus said in the moments leading to his execution. It is breathtaking. And we can really summarize like his attitudes and actions in the very last one before the most powerful Roman in, in that area. His name was Pontius Pilate. And you got to imagine that the crowds of thousands of people screaming to crucify him. Imagine going through six trials where you haven't actually done anything wrong and they're mocking you, they're spitting on you, they're beating you, they're making fun of you, they brought false accusations against you. And Jesus really does two things. He either remains totally silent or he speaks the truth like, like so radically that it infuriates everybody. He doesn't stand up on a soapbox, he doesn't call down heavens, angels, he either stays silent or he speaks the truth. And we're going to see that come out in this passage as he speaks to Pilate. Pilate has already had him beaten within an inch of his life. You really, and, and this is graphic, but you really have to imagine a very broken human body, so bloody and bruised and beaten. Uh, he, he, we think he was, he was unrecognizable, he was so beaten and bruised. And imagine that, that Jesus uh, standing in front of Pontius Pilate and Pontius says, where, where are you from? Where do you come from, man? Like they want to just annihilate you and you haven't done anything. Like what's going on? And he stays silent. I mean, that's the moment you and I would have been on our, our hands and knees begging for our life claiming our rights, and we watch him navigating it so powerfully. It's like, why did you talk to me? That would have been so frustrating. Why did you talk to me? Don't you realize I have the power to release you or to crucify you? And Jesus says, you don't have power over me unless it were given to you from above. This is the third time he speaks into this, this way to live underneath authority and we, we alluded to this back in the second message when we talked about submission. Because we talked about the reason why we submit isn't because the people we're submitting to are righteous or good or believe what we believe or that they're not even, you know, they're, they're basing their decisions off of things that aren't necessarily factually true. Does that give us a right to rebel? Well, not according to Jesus it doesn't. Because Jesus helps us understand authority comes from God. That's what dictates our behavior. And so you, you see this like theme emerge. When Jesus stepped into that traffic circle, what did we see? And we get into this passage. Was it prescriptive or descriptive? Is he issuing a command or are we getting to see him navigate the most complex traffic circle the world has ever known? And what example is he setting for us? Like imagine... Let's use some of the language of Jesus here. He looks at his disciples and he says, come and follow me. And then as we follow him, we see him navigating it like that? Man, that looks different. That looks different from many of the homes that we grew up in. That looks different from our culture. That looks different from everything. And I think it should really challenge us that when it comes to this intersection of faith and life, who, who are we really following? Whose ideologies are we really listening to? Who's, whose voice is crowding our minds and our hearts? Who has our attention? Imagine you drive up to the traffic circle. Who are you, who's in front of you? Who are you following? And for the vast majority of us, we're, we're following people who have not done it really well, who, came to, who seem to keep circling around the same issues year after year with no real success. It actually stands in contrast to what we see Jesus doing. 
And I think there's an invitation, like maybe we could do it differently. Maybe God is calling us to like live out this radical way of Jesus like in the midst of all the complexity. Maybe this is our time. Maybe this is when it matters. Because maybe there's people in your life standing on the shoulder going, I want to see how they do this. And if they see you following Jesus, ah, that could be a catalyst for change. But they see you following the people on TV or the rhetoric on podcasts. They, they see you just regurgitating what, what's being said and they're sitting around your dinner table and they're, they're not watching you follow Jesus. They're watching you, you, you follow a political commentator. They're watching you follow headlines. They're watching you follow paranoia and fear instead of instead of following the way of faith and hope and life and love. So we've looked at the three teachings of Jesus. And now let's ask the big question. Now we have, now we have like this gospel way to look at life. And now let's ask this really hard question. It's come up over and over again. I just listen, thank you so much for your feedback through this series. It has been so helpful. And most of it is centered around this question in some form or the other. When do we get to disobey? And I want to, uh, it's a great question and we're going to answer it. But I want to add a little something to it. When does God permit civil disobedience according to a biblical worldview? Not according to your worldview, not according to your mom or dad's worldview, not according to Fox News or CNN's worldview, but according to the scriptures. And here's the beautiful thing. And I've saved this for the very end, but after today, you will have gone through nearly every passage in the scriptures that's talked about our role. And today, we're going to go through nearly every passage that talks about when it's okay to disobey the civil authorities. We're going to have the biblical worldview. The question is going to be, when we get to the intersection, what are we going to be following? Now, to do this, we're going to have to cruise through nine passages. We've already been through three. We're going to cruise through nine and, and so, uh, for my note takers, I'm just going to leave this up here. You can write these down and go back and look at them later. But I'm going to go through each one of them. And I'm just going to tell the story a little bit, and then we're going to be able to see, okay, this is when civil disobedience is talked about in the scriptures, and here's what it said about it, and this is going to give us some indication on how we can navigate this complex situation we're in. Exodus chapter 1, uh, almost 4,000 years ago, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people are enslaved in Egypt, and they keep having babies. And the Pharaoh wants to control the population. And so he tells the Hebrew midwives, uh, when they have baby boys, you need to execute them. And the Hebrew midwives are like, oh, no, we're not going to do that. And so they spare the lives of these children. And the scripture records, it's because they had a fear of God. That means like a holiness, a reverence, an honor for the things of God over and against Pharaoh. Civil disobedience is commended when it comes to the preservation of life in Exodus chapter 1, second book of the Bible. The next time we see it comes in Joshua chapter 2. This is a little bit flash forward. The nation has been liberated from slavery. They're now entering into the promised land, but there's a city standing in their way known as Jericho. So the commander, Joshua, sends two spies into Jericho to kind of check out what's going on. Those two spies stay at a lady's house by the name of Rahab. And word gets out in Jericho that Rahab has spies at her house. And so they're like, hey, Rahab, we got to kill those spies. You need to hand them over. And Rahab's like, who? Spies? Oh, what do you, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you mean those guys that came by earlier? No, they totally took off. And she's like, they're really upstairs. And so they're like, oh, they're not here? Okay, thanks, Rahab. And they go on their way. She totally defied the order for the preservation of life. And it's commended in the scriptures. She's actually in the lineage of Jesus and is mentioned later on in the New Testament as a person of faith. It's beautiful. We see it again in 1 Samuel chapter 14. This is a super sketchy period in the nation's life. So it's the time of the monarchy, the first king in Israel. His name was Saul. Saul had a son named Jonathan. Uh, the nation of Israel is engaged in a battle. King Saul is like, nobody gets to eat until we win this battle. And the army's like, oh, we're so hungry. Except Jonathan doesn't hear the order. And so he kind of takes a break from the battle, goes, has some chips and salsa, gets a little siesta. He's like, ah, feels so good. And then everybody's like, Jonathan, your dad ordered nobody to eat or they're going to get killed. 
And sure enough, King Saul hears what son Jonathan did, and it's like, sorry, son, lights out for you. And the nation, the people of Israel, like, cry out against the king. No, you can't do it. And they saved Jonathan's life, and it's commended in the scriptures. Civil disobedience, permissible by God for the preservation of life. You see in a pattern emerge. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, this is a fascinating chapter in your Old Testament if you've never read it. Uh, this, is a, this is a goodie. But there's this guy that's mentioned almost in passing as he gets introduced. His name is Obadiah. And in 1 Kings chapter 18 it says, Obadiah uh, disregarded the, the king and queen, uh, queen who, who ordered all the prophets of God to be executed. And Obadiah uh, got a hundred of God's prophets and hid them in caves. And he fed them and took care of them. And he's commended in the scriptures as somebody who feared the Lord. Again, for the preservation of life. Example after example. How many examples have we seen? Well, just one. Preservation of life. Second Kings chapter 11. Uh, I'm actually going to put this one up on the screen because I have a hard time pronouncing these names. And you'll hear why in just a second. Uh, when Athaliah, the mother of King Ahaziah, Ahaziah, he learned, okay, so grandma, oh, I'm sorry, mom of king finds out her son dies and she decides to destroy his lineage so that she can remain in power. That's not a very nice grandma. And so it says, Ahaziah's sister, Jehoshaphat, the daughter of king Jehoram, took Ahaziah's infant son, you're seeing why I put it up on the screen, by the name of Joash, and stole him away from among the rest of the king's children who were about to be killed. Preservation of life, commended by God. Now, these should be really familiar because they appear in like every children's Bible, which is odd when you actually know what the story is. Um, so, flash forward in the nation's history, the, monarch, the monarchy crumbles, and uh, the nation gets conquered and deported, taken as slaves into Babylon. While in Babylon... Uh, the king there creates a golden statue and tells everybody, uh, you're going to bow down and worship a golden statue of me, or I'm going to set you on fire. It's in every Bible of children that I know. It's very strange. And so there are these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are like, well, I guess we're going to get set on fire, because they will not bow down and worship. And sure enough, the king's like, well, sorry guys, off into a furnace. It's this beautiful story of redemption. But they suffered the consequences of that civil disobedience and God used that punishment as a megaphone for God's redemption and God's presence. And that actually is a powerful scene. Just a couple chapters later, new king, same area. He issues an order. Nobody can pray except to me for the next 30 days. And there's a guy there by the name of Daniel. He, the, the, the scripture records, he hears this command and he goes, hmm. And he goes up into his room and he prays to God. And we find out, you know, there was this big trap set for Daniel because everybody who lived there didn't like Daniel because the king liked him and God liked him. We got to get rid of that guy. That becomes a theme throughout the scriptures. And he gets thrown to lions to tear him apart limb from limb. And yet God redeems him and saves him and becomes this beautiful picture of what it looks like to remain faithful against the most debilitating and crushing circumstances. And we have concluded every example of civil disobedience throughout the Old Testament. Do you see the theme? Preservation of life when the civil authorities are asking you to kill people, listen to God, okay? When the civil authorities are asking you to worship a false god, God gives you 100% full permission. Don't do that. Pray to some other false god. God gives you permission. You want to know where the line is? It's right here. Don't do it. Do not sin against God for the sake of civil disobedience. We can say, I know from a biblical worldview, there's three examples. Preservation of life, worship, and prayer. And there's two examples in the New Testament, and they're actually the same example. It's just one idea. In Acts chapter 4, so Jesus comes, lives, gives his life for your sin and for my sin, dies, and then comes back from the dead, and then gives his disciples 
one prescriptive command. Go and make disciples. This is the one thing I want you to do while, you're, while I'm gone. Go and make disciples. I'll be back. And to do that, I'm going to empower you with my spirit. So that's the first part of the book of Acts. And then what do we see? Peter and James and John filled with God's spirit and they're preaching the gospel. And it infuriates the nation of Israel and the political leaders and the religious leaders. And so they have them arrested. And they're like, you can't do that anymore. No longer are you allowed to preach in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John say, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? I have heard this verse taken out of context more times than any other verse when it comes to this traffic circle. And it's taken, it's ripped out of its context. And I would be very careful from people who who take the word of God and weaponize it against other people. Be very careful of those individuals. But you see this passage in its context, and it is so life-changing. And they say this, we, we can't stop telling people about everything we've seen and heard. You can't, you can't stop me from telling people about Jesus. And I've had some very well-meaning, Jesus-following people come up to me and say, you know there's coming a time when you're not going to be able to preach. That's the, that's the direction our nation is going. Now that's dark. I, I'm a little bit more optimistic than that. And if it does happen, and they close this place, and they turn off my microphone, do you think that's going to stop me? No, it's not. Will I be put in prison? Maybe. You know where the Apostle Paul spent a lot of his time? In prison for preaching the gospel. You know what happened to Peter? Executed for preaching the gospel. You know what happened to the Apostle John? Sent to a prison island for preaching the gospel. Like, that would, that would be fitting, actually. And the fact that we've been able to have this religious freedom up until this point has been nothing but the sheer, sheer blessing of God himself. And we should take advantage of it every moment we got. And if somebody comes to you and says, you can't preach in the name of Jesus, you can't tell people how God has changed your life, you have full permission from the God of heaven to go, well, that's okay, I appreciate your opinion, but I'm going to still tell people about Jesus. Well, we're going to lock you up. That's okay, I'll tell people there too. The lines are super clear. It happens again. They arrest him, they beat him, they try everything to get him to stop, and they're like, we told you to stop preaching the gospel, and they're like, Man, we can't. We, we can't. We can't stop preaching. We have to listen to what God has called us to do over any human authority. This is the line. Uh, preservation of life, worship, prayer, and preaching. You and I have a tendency to draw a lot of lines that aren't in alignment with a biblical worldview. My challenge to all of us today is to really consider, where did that come from? Who are you following? I'm much more comfortable following the teaching of Jesus and the clear teaching of the scripture because we just went through every single passage. That should, that should give us some hope. Like, oh, we can do this. Following Jesus, we can navigate this complex traffic circle. And I want to I I put up a quote of a, of, a, of a brilliant theologian, author, teacher by the name of Jack Cottrell. He sums, sums it up better than I've heard anybody do it. There's only one valid situation in which God permits us to break civil law. There's only one valid situation. It's where obedience to the law would in and itself cause us to sin against the laws of God. In every other case, disobedience to civil law is itself a sin against God, and it's time for Christians to begin taking this seriously. I'm like, amen, brother. We want to listen to every other voice and pay attention to every other sign, and we haven't been following Jesus. And I think it's time we do because it's going gonna, it's gonna to shine so brightly right now because things are getting, things are going a little out of control. And the way that you live in the midst of this traffic circle is going to make all the difference in the world to your friends, to your neighbors, to your family members. And as they watch you navigate it following Jesus, it's going to set a pattern for them. And you could maybe be able to say like Paul said, follow me because I'm following Jesus. So come on, let's go. What a beautiful way to live. This is how we live out the gospel. It's through submission in our attitudes and our actions while following 
Jesus. Let's summarize the whole series in one single statement. And for my note takers in here, number four, we've just entitled this whole idea as the intersection. And we can wrap all of this idea up in a single image of a roundabout. And here's the, here's the beautiful thing. You can't live in Columbia without going through a roundabout. And hopefully the next time you do, it'll be a fresh reminder, oh, who we follow through these matters. The signs that I watch and navigate, it absolutely matters. And let me leave you today with one challenging question. When it comes to the intersection of faith and life, who are we going to follow? And what is God's word calling us to do? Who is he calling us to be in the midst of these very turbulent times I just believe with all of my heart it is time for us as followers of Jesus to show people what the gospel looks like in real life. And if, and if today you're here and, and you wouldn't say you're a Jesus follower, you're just checking things out, you just wanted to come with your girlfriend, listen, maybe your whole life you've stayed away from the things of God because you thought following Jesus meant something else. And maybe you're hearing for the first time, oh, that Jesus stuff is pretty radical. And I ain't seeing a lot of it out there today. Hear today God's invitation to you to follow a risen Savior who has gone through it before and is asking each of us to follow him as we navigate it. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, search our hearts. And hear our confession. And hear our prayer for forgiveness. For we have been following the wrong voices. And taking the wrong path. And may today by your word and your spirit. You embolden your people to be refreshed in a brand new way. To follow your son Jesus. Knowing he's gone before us. He's already done it. We just need to follow the way. So I pray, God, as you have promised, would you bring these scriptures to life in our hearts and in our daily lives? And may it be a beacon of hope to this world, not for our sake, but for your sake. Here today, our submission to you as our King, as our Lord, as our Redeemer, as the maker and lover of our souls. And may you hear today from the bottom of our hearts, we love you. And we long to follow you. Help us, guide us, and lead us. We stand on your promise. And pray this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We get this incredible opportunity right now to celebrate and to remember something that I believe is both prescriptive and descriptive. We're going to take communion together. And Jesus, on that last night, When he was in the upper room with his closest friends and his followers, he prescribed them something. He said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. He took the bread and he took the juice. He said, this is my body broken for you, and this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I think it's incredible that 2,000 years later, we're still doing that as his followers. And it's not just a, a, you know, in and of itself, it's just we're taking a, a little tiny piece of bread and a little cup of juice. And sometimes it doesn't always taste that good, <laughs> for being honest, especially these little travel ones that we're doing right now in the, in the season of COVID. It's much different, but, you know, on the surface, that's all it is. But there's something deeper going on. There's a spiritual reality at play when he says, do this in remembrance of me. And You know, I think through every time I take it, I'm reminded of the fact that just as we need bread and water to survive physically, we need Jesus to survive spiritually. And he's he's made that available to us through his sacrifice. And so we remember him. We remember him when we take these emblems. Remember that he's with us through challenging times. You know, I'm reminded of that roundabout that, that Brad just showed us. Now, oftentimes we find ourselves unable to navigate those things on our own. And so when we take communion, we're reminded that he is with us and he is for us. He's available at every opportunity. He just says, abide in me. So let's take this together right now. Take the bread, take the juice, and let it be a remembrance. 
right here and right now. And Jesus is inviting every single one of us to abide in him, to remember he is with us and he is for us. For every decision, through every flaw, for everything that you're going through right now. And each, each one of us is on a different path, on a different page in that story. He's with us. So right now we're going to worship him together. So we're going to stand and sing. And if that's something that you um, are uncomfortable with right now, feel free to exit through the back doors. We're going to sing together. This song is called King of Kings. And I love the message behind it because it reminds us who Jesus is. He's the King of Kings. No matter who is currently the leader of our cities and our governments, we know that eternity is ruled by the King of Kings. His name is Jesus, and we worship him together. That's why we've come here this morning is to bring him honor and glory and to align our hearts with him. So let's sing this out together.
matchless in grace and mercy. There is nowhere we can hide from your love. You are steadfast, never failing. You are faithful. And all creation is in awe of who you are. You're the healer of the sick and the broken. For comfort for every heart that mourns. You are our King and our Savior forever. And for eternity we will sing of all you've done. And for eternity we will sing of all you've done. So we sing. between us, God with us, God is for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. Your heart, your heart, it moves with compassion and there is life and there is healing in your love you're the father the son the holy spirit and for eternity we will see of all you've done so we
God, we thank you that you are with us and that you are for us and we know that you love us. God, help us to remember that this week as we, we strive to follow you with all of our hearts. Lord, I pray, I pray that in those moments of temptation, in those moments of weakness, that we would lean on your strength. It's not by our strength, but it's by yours that we're led by your spirit. And we know that you can do all things through those who love you. God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you this morning. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.